Hi, this is Jessica with cutesycrafts.com. This is just gonna be a video for all of the beginners out there to show you what supplies you need and how to start embroidering for beginners. So the first thing we need to talk about are your supplies. And all of the things that I talk about in this video, I will be leaving a link to in the description. So go check that out if you miss something. So first and foremost, we need to talk about fabric. Anything that you can stick a needle through is fair game, but as a beginner, there are gonna be things that are easier to embroider on than others. My very favorite thing to embroider on is either 100% linen or this, which is a linen cotton blend called Essex Linen, and I will leave a link to this. This is what I use exclusively for most of my projects. Anything that's stretchy or really thin is gonna be harder to embroider on. This is a really nice thick weight, um, doesn't have a whole lot of stretch to it, and it has a nice even weave, meaning all of the threads in it are evenly spaced, and um, it just embroiders really nicely. The next thing you'll need is an embroidery hoop and this keeps your fabric nice and stretched tightly so that your fabric won't pucker when you're embroidering. This is a really nice thick hoop that I have. It's a Hardwick Manor hoop. These are kind of pricey, so if you're just beginning and you're not sure what kind of hoop you want, um, I'll leave a couple different links of options of what to buy in the description. And generally you'll want your hoop to be slightly larger than the project that you are embroidering on. So for example, if I was gonna do this fawn pattern, this is about the same size as that, so I'd probably wanna go one hoop size larger just to make sure that I have enough room and I'm not running into my hoop when I try to stitch. And then if you plan on putting your project in a frame when you're done, I like to get a cheaper embroidery hoop for that. You don't wanna be using up your nice embroidery hoops for framing, just a nice cheap one will do. You'll also need embroidery floss in several different colors. DMC is the most widely available floss that I know of and is good quality to use. It comes in a skein like this, and then I like to wind them around little bobbins like this just so that they don't get tangled as easily. I also really enjoy Aurafil embroidery floss. It comes on these cute wooden spools. They're a little bit more pricey and a little bit um, harder to find. They don't sell them in like my local craft store, um, but they're really pretty and really good quality as well. You will also need embroidery needles in several different sizes. I like to make sure I have a size three, size eight, size nine, and size 10. So what I use are these really nice, expensive um, embroidery needles. They're called tulip needles. They come in these cute little tubes. So I have a pack of seven, eight, nine, and 10, and then I got another one of size three. But again, if you're just starting, you might wanna start with more something more expensive, and that's totally fine. So a pack like this that has sizes three through nine would be perfect. Um, I did mention that I like to have a size 10, but that's for only using one strand of embroidery floss, which we won't be doing much of. So the size three through nine would be perfect. You also need scissors for cutting thread. Um, embroidery scissors work best. You want something that's really sharp and small is nice so that you don't have to carry around large scissors. And then you will also need some kind of tracing supplies. There are several, several ways to trace embroidery patterns and I'm only gonna go over one of them today. So for that, we'll need a friction pen made by Pilot and optionally a light table or you can just use a sunny window. Once you've gathered all of your supplies, it's time to transfer your embroidery pattern onto your fabric. Now, like I said, there are several ways to do this. This is my favorite method for when I am using a light or white piece of fabric. Um, I have another method for if your fabric is dark, and I've got a link to that in the description below. And what this is, it's a pen that disappears with heat. So when I'm done embroidering, I can just hit it with a blow dryer and all of my marks will disappear. One small caveat with this method is that the marks can come back if they are exposed to cold again. So keep that in mind, especially if you live in a really cold place. I just like to make sure that every single mark that I make is covered completely with the pen. And if you're not comfortable with that, like I said, there are other ways to do it. So I've got my light table, my pattern, and my fabric. 
and you want to line them up in that order. And then having the light on would make my pattern show through a little bit easier, um, but I can kind of see it here. So what you'll do is just lightly trace over your pattern using the pen. So I'm not going to trace over the whole thing, but you get the general idea. Um, each of my patterns has a circle around them. I recommend not tracing over that since we will not be stitching that. Next, we'll need to put our fabric into our embroidery hoop. So loosen the screw at the top, take that apart, and then the part that doesn't have the screw on it goes underneath our fabric. And then tighten this just a little bit and stretch the fabric over the hoop, pressing it down. And then what I like to do is tighten it a little bit more and then pull evenly on all the fabric around the hoop. And then it should be called what's drum tight. So when you press on it, you can hear a little sound. It sounds like a drum. Next, we're gonna start stitching, but before we do, I wanna talk about how to read a pattern. So for my patterns, I have the picture and then I have letters with arrows pointing to several different parts of the pattern. So for example, if you go to A, you can see that that's the outline of the deer and then A down here says we're gonna be using a split stitch with two strands and then I give you the color. So every embroidery pattern that you see is made up of different kinds of stitches and I'm going to show you some basic ones later on today. And then they're also made up of different amounts of strands. More strands is going to equal a thicker line. So embroidery floss comes in one strand that is six smaller strands. So you can see those there. So what this means that if the pattern says two strands, that you're going to separate your embroidery floss and only use two of the strands out of those six. If it says one strand, you'll use one. That's not as common. Um, normally I work in two strands, three strands, and sometimes six strands. And then for your embroidery needles, the bigger the number, the smaller the needle. And then the number of strands that you use is going to determine which needle you use. So if we are using all six strands of embroidery floss, we'll use a size three needle. If we're using three strands of embroidery floss, we use a size eight. Two strands of embroidery floss is a size nine. One strand of embroidery floss is a size 10 needle. To separate your embroidery floss, you first need to cut off a length of the floss to work with. And I like to measure from my fingertips to my shoulder. So I'll just pull this down and then it goes all the way up to my shoulder. Snip off that amount. Once you have your length of floss, the easiest way to separate the strands out is actually one by one. So if you take one strand of floss and then very lightly hold the rest of the embroidery floss. You can pull up on that one strand and you can see it kind of bunches up here in the bottom and keep pulling until that comes out and then the rest of this unravels. And that's the easiest way to do it so that your floss doesn't get tangled up. So then if I needed two strands of embroidery floss, I can pull out another one straighten them out, line up the two ends, and then incorporate them back together. And then if you're using three strands, you can go ahead and grab another strand and add that one to the mix. Next, you'll need to thread your needle. And since I'm using three strands of embroidery floss, I'm using my size eight needle. And the easiest way to thread a needle is to make sure that you start with a clean cut on the ends of these so that they're all the same length. And then you can either dip this in a little bit of water or do what most people probably do and lick the end of your thread. So once you have that wet, you can just kind of flatten it out, line up your needle with the thread and do your best to get that through there. If you find this is something that you really struggle with, check out my video on needle threaders. So once you have that through there, pull it until you've got about four or five inches through, and then 
fold that over and let that dangle with the rest of your thread. So you can see here the way my thread is situated. I've got my needle four or five inches here and then the long end over here. And then for every stitch that you do, your embroidery floss needs to be secured in the back. And the easiest way to do that is to tie a knot in the long end of your embroidery floss. So you can just tie that around once and then twice to make a good size knot. So that way, when you bring your needle up through the back of your work, it's always secure in the back so you can start stitching. When you become more advanced, there are ways to do this without tying a knot in the back, but for beginners, I always just suggest starting with a knot. I'll leave a link to the more advanced methods in the description below for when you're ready for that. So you can see I have my knot here at the beginning. This is the back of my work. You'll have some stitches that you've done, and then in order to secure this thread before you cut it off at the end, you'll just weave it under a few of the stitches. I'm not going onto the front of my work at all, just weaving underneath, stitching underneath some of the stitches that are on the back. Another way to do this, if you don't have a whole long line of stitches to go under, you can just go under one, leave a loop there, bring your needle through the loop and then pull and that gives you a little knot. And then I like to do that two times just to make sure that it doesn't come undone. And then you can go ahead and trim that off and then trim off the excess over here. And that's how you would start and stop your stitches. Another little beginner tip that I like to make sure everyone knows is say you're stitching here and you decide you want to come stitch something over here. You should not just take your needle from here. So I've got right here, my needles coming out here. You shouldn't just skip from here to here because what's going to happen if I bring my needle up down here when I've been working over here is now I'm going to have this big line and you can see that through the back of your fabric. So try not to do that as much as possible. What you would want to do is end your thread like I showed you earlier here, snip that off, and then just start the thread again down here, tying a new knot and starting over again with the thread in a different spot. The next step is to learn your embroidery stitches. So like I said before, each pattern is made up of different types of embroidery stitches to make your full design. I haven't gone over each one of these stitches in this video because I have separate videos for all of these that actually go into more detail for each one. So if you're interested in making this specific pattern, um, I've got a link to that that you can check out. Start a running stitch by bringing your needle up through the back of your work and then moving one stitch length forward back to the back of your hoop and then go one more stitch length forward bring the needle back up and then another stitch length forward and bring the needle back down and you want the space between your stitches to be similar to the length of your actual stitches. And get it as close as you can. It's not going to be perfect, but that's what makes hand embroidery look so unique is that it wasn't done by a machine. And just continue along the line until you get to the end. For the back stitch, you want to bring your thread up from the back. And just like the running stitch, we're going to go one stitch forward. And then we're going to skip a stitch length. And bring our needle up through the back again. But instead of moving forward like we did with the running stitch, we're going to move back, hence the name the back stitch. 
and come back down through the hole that you previously went up in on that last stitch. And so continue doing that. Move forward a stitch coming in from the back and then move backwards a stitch going down into the same hole from that last stitch. To do a split stitch, bring your needle from the back to the front. Go one stitch length forward. And just like the name suggests, the next stitch you're going to come up through the back, but you're going to split the middle of the previous stitch. So come right up through the middle of that thread. And then go another stitch length forward. And then come up through the middle of that stitch. And sometimes at the end of my split stitch, depending on what look I'm going for, this last stitch, every other stitch is split and that one isn't. So I like to go back and split that one and then just end right here at the end of that previous stitch. To do a stem stitch, bring your needle up through the back. And then this first stitch you're going to want to make kind of a little bit longer than you normally would. Just a little bit. And then before pulling your thread all the way down, you want to bring the needle up at the halfway point between where you came up and where you went down. And then pull that up. Um, and then you will go now a shorter stitch length forward, just a normal stitch length. And then before bringing that down, you want to bring your needle up through the hole that your first stitch length went down into. And then pull that up. And you'll notice I'm keeping my thread is coming out on the same side every time. So let me show you. So I'm doing one stitch length forward, bringing my needle up through that last hole and I'm pulling the thread away this way rather than bringing it under and going that way. And at the end here, before I do my last stitch, I kind of like to do just one stitch and leave just a tiny bit left that I need to do, so shorter than I would normally do my stitch. So that's a normal stitch length there. And then for the last stitch, it's going to be really short, so just about up to there. I feel like that makes it blend a little bit more seamlessly to make one constant line. To do a French knot, bring your needle up through the spot where you would like your knot to be. And then you're going to take your needle and point it away from your work. And you're going to wrap your thread around once and twice and then turn your needle. Make sure you're holding on to this end here and go back down in or near the same hole that you came out of. And the whole time you want to make sure that you're holding this tightly, but not too tight because then you'll get too tight of a knot here for your needle to go back through. So just kind of hold it a little taut there and then bring your needle back down through the other side with your other hand and then go ahead and pull that and make sure you're holding onto this left side still. I got some of my fabric there. And then once you get to about that point, you can let go and then just give that a tiny little tug there to make sure that it's straight. So again, bring your needle up through the back, pointing away from your work, wrap the needle once, twice, go back down near the same hole that you came up through Hold with your left hand this thread over here and push the needle down here and then pull it through the back. Make sure you're continuing to hold with your left. And then when you get to about here, you can let go and you've got a nice French knot. To do a satin stitch, I first like to draw some directional lines to show me 
which way my stitch is gonna be going. That's especially helpful if you're doing a curved shape like a flower petal. But you start by bringing your thread up through the back and um, all you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be coming in from the back on one side and then going down into the fabric on the other side over and over again until you've filled in the shape. And so what I first like to do when I start stitching is break the satin stitch up into sections. Again, this is really helpful if you are doing a curved shape. And then what I like to do is go back in between each of these sections and split them in half again with another stitch. But all this does is it helps me keep my stitches more even. You don't have to do it this way, but I struggled with the satin stitch for a long time and this really helped. And then once you finish that section, you can start on another section and then just keep going like that. Once you've finished all of your stitching, you can frame it in a hoop like I've done here. Um, I like to put a felt circle on the back. I have a tutorial for how to stitch that on that I will leave in the description below. Or you can take it out of the hoop to display in a different way, or if it's clothing, obviously you won't want to keep it in the hoop. Best of luck on your embroidery journey, and try to remember that your stitches don't have to be perfect. Mine are not perfect in anything that I make, and that's what makes it look handmade and beautiful and that you put some love into it. Head over to my blog, cutesycrafts.com, for tons of free embroidery pattern downloads and more information on how to embroider for beginners.